professor of urban planning. You came to uh, the College of Architecture and Planning to explore the relevant yet unfamiliar. I think you're going to explore that today. This is not a sampling of what's on the midterm exam in uh, a planning theory course, but I think it should fascinate you. It's uh, her opening slide. Uh, by way of introduction, um, I wanted to introduce today's very special speaker. She's come all the way from Leesburg, Virginia. And she's been here for a couple of days. I've tried to give her as best of a tour I can, not only of the campus, but of the varied sites of what I think are uh, stellar examples of planning and community development in this fairly backward state of planning called Indiana. Most of them, in my view, are in the Indianapolis area. And I think she was uh, mightily impressed with some of the things that we showed her. So she'll at least go back with the impression that uh, we're not the least uh, progressive of the states in terms of planning. Susan Swift has had 25 years of professional uh, practical experience. Uh, she has been a planner for that period of time and she's, during that uh, career span, has been director of uh, some local governmental operations in the field of planning and uh, community development. She's practiced in the states of Florida and Virginia and in the cities of St. Petersburg, Pinellas Park, Tampa, and Leesburg, Virginia. Her professional credentials are a master's degree from Florida State in urban planning, as well as membership in the American Institute of Certified Planners, our professional organization. She has been honored by the American Planning Association in a number of areas. She has served as juror for uh, APA national awards as well for the awards uh, given by its Florida chapter. She uh, uh, has been and continues to be a member of the APA Planning Accreditation Board National Site Review Team, which is, uh, should pick up our ears because a couple of years ago we had and a reaccreditation of our program here. And of note, if you wanted to ask her any questions in this area, the, um, the University of Arizona program uh, was in some trouble financially, that is the state was going to eliminate it among 21 programs of the state. It was one of the two that were saved and she just uh, came back there from a very favorable review of their program as well. Uh, she has been APA awarded for innovative zoning and historic district regulations for community design of a Main Street plan for, and her service to Florida state government has been in her varied areas of expertise, including concepts that you may have to ask questions on, concurrency, whatever that is, we know what that is as planners, development of re regional impacts, development incentives, and statewide model land development ordinance or code. Her topic today is on a topic that I've actually taught when I teach planning theory, which is that the practice of planning depends on its political context. And so where planning has succeeded or failed, you largely then take a look at the policies and the political climate that mold planning in those particular states some of them requiring extraordinary leadership in order to get right. She'll talk about three of those states today. Um, one will be Florida, another one will be Maryland, and the third will be Virginia, or what I call two smart and one retarded state uh, planning. And uh, I think her topic is uh, of relevance to all three disciplines of this college. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my friend, my colleague, and uh, our guest lecture speaker today, Susan Swift. Oh, I'm good. Now, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Thanks a lot for having me and coming at 4 o'clock. I appreciate it on a Monday. Um, I didn't want to do a planner joke, so I'm doing this instead, because I thought if I did a planner joke, I would only have to offend either architects or engineers, because planners, it's the only time, 
planners feel jokes are funny is when we make fun of the other, so, so I skip that. Um, as Bruce said, I, I now work in Virginia after most of my career in Florida. And Virginia, as you will see, is not one of the two smart states. <laughs> it's the other one. And um, which has given me a good appreciation and why I kind of came up with this topic and I hoped it might be interesting for you um, to see how state law, which is frankly pretty boring, actually does relate to what you do as planners or potentially landscape architects or architects when you have to deal with the local governments. Um, but in, in lieu of my joke, one thing Virginia does well, although they don't do planning well and they don't do uh, transportation planning well at all, if you've read lately, DC was, the District of Columbia was just rated the second or third worst for commuting uh, travel in the nation. Um, and I can't remember if we were second only to, Calif to LA or New York, but it wasn't, it wasn't a pretty sight and commuting in, in DC is, is very bad. So one thing Virginia does well when it relates um, to cars is, does anybody know what this is? That I gave you a hint. License plate. My, my favorite. One thing Virginia really knows how to do is license plates and get revenue from them. Um, they sell all kinds of vanity plates, apparently really cheap, because everyone in Virginia um, is not embarrassed to have 30,000 cars per day drive by them, and this is what they think of them. <laughs> this is what they want to be known as. Um, so since I've been there, I've been fascinated by what people would want everyone driving by them every day to know them as, as they're sitting in traffic for hours. Um, and then the other thing that Virginia also makes money on is uh, they not only have the vanity plates for the University of Virginia or Virginia Tech, but you can virtually get any university. I can get the University of Florida or Florida State uh, license tags under the Virginia name, as long as you're willing to pay for it. And then I can get something like, excuse my French, UVA sucks on the, uh, on the license plate. And these are real license plates that I have driven behind. So my favorite being no soup for you. And um, we cover all religions over here. Obviously the zero SPF was a convertible and the why save it was a Beamer. So. We, we cover, and we even have our Washington, D.C. Uh, politicos, um, the anarchy, and uh, the one uh, Professor Frankel could not figure out, uh, one for you to debate. But other than that, I think he got all the rest. <laughs> so um, anyway, with that, I'll, that's Virginia. So here goes my uh, little uh, license plate theme. What I, what I wanted to do was um, not depress the uh, planners here, but um, talk to you about how some of these state laws and other laws really do drill down to what happens at the local government, which as planners, architects and landscape architects, you will, you will deal much more with on a daily basis. Um, so I think what you'll see is that these are the three main topics I'm going to cover. The enabling laws of the state, um, the three states that we talked about, then I'll go into the comprehensive plans and then the tools for implementation which I think you'll see are the, are the most important really when you come down to it. Um, I think what you'll also see is how these not only help um, 
help or hinder you as planners, but also um, how it, it affects your effectiveness as a planner. How much can you really get done? Is the law behind you for it? Um, obviously, the other part of how effective you are as a planner is, is part of your own personal abilities, and that's a whole other lecture, so we don't have enough time for that. Um, the enabling laws, uh, if, you, if you study, and I'm not a lawyer, I will give you this uh, caveat right now, but if you study the constitutions of the 50 states, um, none of them mention local governments. They don't mention cities, towns, townships, they don't get into that. Um, the local governments are created and empowered by the state constitution. Um, states will outline those kinds of powers in either a municipal charter or legislation, depends on what state you're in. Um, some states actually have different terms that don't mean anything. In Florida, a t whether you call it a town, a township, a village, a city, they have the same level of power. In Virginia, if you're a town, you have different powers than you are if you're a city. A city has more powers, a town has fewer powers. Um, so it, every state is going to be different, but it, it's important in, again, in the effectiveness of how we can uh, regulate development and actually operate as planners every day. Um, two of the bigger ways of um, defining those powers are, and there are several others, but most states are either home rule states or Dillon rule states. And home rule states broadly define their powers um, of the local government, so they will delegate something to a local government and not get really picky about it. Uh, they, states don't really interfere in home, home rule um, states. They allow the local governments, when they, once they given, they've given them that power, they allow them to kind of do what they, with, what they want with those. They have a lot, of, a lot more autonomy. Uh, Florida is a home rule state. Maryland is a home rule state. Not as broad powers as Florida, but um, the Dillon Rule, which is a minority of states use the Dillon Rule, and, and again, these, are, these two things are kind of philosophies of how states delegate power to the local governments. So there are other philosophies, but these are two significant ones if you looked across the 50 states. The Dillon Rule defines the power really narrowly. Um, the state is kind of the dad in the relationship, and it gives little powers piecemeal to the local governments. It gives some powers to cities that towns don't get. Um, it, it just delegates them very, very piecemeal and very incrementally. Um, if there's a doubt as to what power a local government has, then they don't have that power. And, and um, as you will see, Virginia is a Dillon Rule state. This is Mr. Dillon, and all planners in Virginia are not fond of this guy. <laughs> and you can see where his philosophy came from uh, 100 and some odd years ago, 150 years ago. So that's really set planning back or has not let Virginia planning to move forward because this philosophy is what the state uses to charge local governments in Virginia with what planning and what new ideas and new tools they can come up with. And essentially, they can't, you can't come up with any new tools or new planning uh, implementation or new plans ideas unless the state specifically says you can do this. You can do impact fees. Even if they kind of beat around the bush, unless it uses those words, it has been upheld in court that you cannot do that in Virginia or in another Dillon Rule state. Um, they clearly affect not only your, um, how you do planning on an everyday basis, they affect you as a resident and your quality of life. The, if the local government cannot do more planning and or more regulation without permission from the state, then um, 
it affects our quality of life. You're restricted on what kinds of things you can do as a planner. And um, in, as you, part of the problems of Virginia traffic is because we really don't have a lot of tools to make land use match transportation and regulate growth as much as in a place like Florida um, or Maryland. So it really, really ties your hands. Um, some examples of enabling laws in, in Florida, um, and I'm sure you've, you all get to study the good states, the good planning states, but you don't really hear about the bad ones, so I'm here to tell you both sides. Um, back in 1972, and I'm not going to go through all these, but I'll try to give you the highlights if you haven't already studied them. In 72, Florida passed its first uh, growth management law as we now know it. And all, all it really focused on then were big projects, um, big development projects. And it gave the local governments and the regional planning councils and the state a way to control and coordinate somebody who came in with a project over 2,000 units or uh, residential units or uh, office complex over 300,000 square feet, um, big projects that were deemed to affect more than that local government. And they set up a whole system of review, uh, a list of about 40 questions the developer had to answer. It was like an environmental in impact statement, but it went beyond the environment. It asked about economic development, affordable housing, how this project would affect all the, how it would affect transportation, um, housing, jobs, uh, environment, and a bunch of other things, schools, a lot of infrastructure questions. And to this day, that system is still in place. It's been modified a little bit, but it was a, an attempt to take the big guerrilla development projects that could really make or break a local area or a neighborhood and get some control on it. Um, it also gave them the first tools for exacting road improvements and those kinds of things from developers. And again, it, this was just the really big ones. So that is, that is still in place, and um, although it has been tinkered with, and it was the first, the first way to get exactions. Um, the 75 Act was actually what set up the mandatory comprehensive plans. The 85 Act put a lot more teeth in it where it made zoning have to be compatible with the comprehensive plan. And when I was in Tampa, it, it was in 1985, and we actually had to rezone every parcel in Tampa to be compliant with our new comprehensive plan. There were 120,000 parcels of land in Tampa. And it took us two years to do it. We divided into four quadrants, and we had this very methodical way of doing it, but a lot of notifications and um, legal ads, and it was a very expensive process, but when all was said and done, our zoning matched our land use, and we could then control what uses we wanted, what densities we wanted, um, what infrastructure, it was somewhat tied to infrastructure at that point, and um, it really put the teeth in the Florida comprehensive planning system. And um, the 90 Act is what came up with the concurrency requirement, which most of the rest of the country knows as um, adequate public facilities ordinances. And um, in, in Florida, the concurrency regs are still in place, although they have been tinkered with a lot, because that was actually one program or one regulation that backfired a little bit in Florida when we first came up with it. And it, it was intended to direct development toward where there were facilities. And because of the way the formula was written, it actually almost did the opposite. And um, that's been amended over the years, and it's been fixed. Um, other people have at least copied the concept, not necessarily the methodology. But it, it was another tool in the toolbox to help tie transportation and land use together and, and make them work a little better. I'll go on and on about Florida, because that's where I'm from, so. Um, Maryland, uh, as you may know it, for its smart, smart growth programs, and I should say that a lot, of, um, a lot of the information when I get to some of these tables, I took out of the, um, the massive two-volume 
uh, APA Smart Growth Handbook that if you haven't, you wouldn't put it under your pillow because it's a little too much, but it's a very good reference document and uh, some of my source material is from there. Um, Maryland is next to Virginia and the antithesis of planning in, um, as Virginia knows it, and they do have smart, where smart growth, the term, started. Uh, some of their major components of their smart growth program is that they, their first act in 92 came up with seven visions and they did a state plan. Local governments were supposed to um, emulate the state plan and those seven visions and if they didn't already have a plan, they were mandated to do one. They do require some zoning consistency, you'll see that later. And probably one of the bigger, um, the bigger hammers that they have built into their law was in 97 where they created this priority funding act. And if you have, um, if a local government wants funding, road funding, um, water, sewer, uh, plant funding, any kind of major infrastructure funding, if, if your plan hasn't designated the area for that infrastructure as a priority funding area, where it's kind of a, an activity center for development, then the state won't contribute to, to that infrastructure project. And they really um, kind of got, got the local governments and put their money where their mouth is and, and have not put a lot of other penalties on planning and zoning in the state but when it really comes down to it, if they're looking for state funds, that's the biggest hammer that they have. We're not gonna to contribute to your road if you approved a development way out in the hinterland where development wasn't really planned for. Um, there's a lot of rural land in Maryland. Surprisingly, you have um, two Marylands almost, the District of Columbia neighbor with all the urban areas and much of the rest of the state is very rural. So they've done a really good job um, enforcing their, their law through, through their pocketbooks. Um, last year they, they put a lot more teeth in their comprehensive plans, but you can read up on that yourself. And here's our list for Virginia. They have one enabling law, and um, it has mandatory planning. Everybody has to do a comprehensive plan and update it every five years and there it stops. Um, there's no state planning department like Virginia and Florida have to send your plan to. There's nobody who looks over your shoulder to see if you did your comprehensive plan every five years. Uh, nobody to see what the contents were. So it, it's, if your local officials or your local citizens don't care about what's in your plan, then n nobody else does either, which is probably the most important audience is your residents, but there's no standard in Virginia for how to do a plan. More importantly, um, there's no consistency. You don't have to have your zoning match your comprehensive plan, which is, it's actually the opposite. There's no recourse or penalty if you don't do it. Um, and it, the most important is the comprehensive plan in Virginia is only a guide. So you have to do it, but when a developer comes in and says, oh, well, I don't want to do that, what's in your plan, I want to do that. And if they're willing to take you to court, you could lose because your plan doesn't rule, your zoning rules. Um, so it's, it's a lot of effort and it gives you a lot of philosophy, but then when it really comes down to being a real tool, in Virginia, your comprehensive plan is not your, your tool and not a hammer. Um, and I'll kind of come back to some of those tools later. Uh, so I can wake you up here. Um, this is one of the things from the Smart Growth um, doc book that I mentioned. Uh, it kind of talks about pros and cons of, first it talks about different kinds of planning. And as I mentioned, Florida and, and Maryland have mandatory planning. Virginia has mandatory planning, but no real teeth in it. Um, so I'll give you a minute to look at this and then maybe you can help me out telling me about Indiana's planning and how it might fit into these four approaches. Is it just advisory? Is it um, an activity with incentives to try to get you to do it? Is it mandatory? 
And is it mandatory just at the local level or do state and regional, does it all have some intergovernmental coordination? And, Well, you'll get an A on the test, though. <laughs> and um, pros and cons to, do you see pros and cons in Indiana and some of the projects that you've worked on to having it that way, a, a pro to having it as advisory? No pros. Any cons? No cons. OK, well, you're going to have to answer again, then, for them. <laughs> No cons. OK, well, maybe at the end we'll come back to that. Um, this is also something that you cannot read, but I'm sure. But um, again, I refer you to the Smart Growth Handbook. It has a great outline um, of all the 50 states and their comprehensive plans. Um, they look at how. Um, whether it's mandatory or not, whether they have to um, do required updates, whether the zoning is required to be compatible with it, um, what the enabling laws are, there's, and, and then most of these lines across here, what elements are either required or optional. Um, and different, some states mandate that certain element, comprehensive plan elements or topics or chapters um, need to be included. Florida has mandatory elements. and several optional ones. Uh, Maryland has some mandatory ones and a lot of optional ones. And Virginia kind of talks about land use and transportation and utilities, and they don't really say much detail about it. But this is a very useful research tool if you want to go back and see a compendium of uh, all the 50 states, whether they have planning or not, and kind of where it, how effective it is. Um, the second topic, the third topic I wanted, well, no, these are second topics still. Um, this is kind of summarizing the table that I had, the two-page table, and getting down to kind of Susan's list of what makes a comprehensive plan effective. Um, and without going through it, you can see that uh, Virginia kind of fails miserably in the comparison of the the other two. Um, Florida has a land use, state land use plan, but they don't, they don't, they loosely tie the local plans and the regional plans to them, but they do have a state plan. Um, and uh, Maryland has an intergovernmental coordination. Other than the fees, it doesn't have a lot of penalties. And then, as you can see, they both have required elements. So I think the fact that states have mandatory plans is a nice thing, but it doesn't necessarily get you very far. Um, as a matter of fact, when I got to Leesburg um, and realized, I mean, I knew that I knew some of the situation in Virginia before I moved there, but um, Leesburg is such a high growth area that I recommended the year that I got there. It was their year that their conference of plan update was due, their five-year update. But before I got there, they hadn't started on it. I recommended that they actually not do the plan update, but they go directly to, excuse me, to um, changing their zoning code because the zoning code is what rules in Virginia. And they had all this growth and all these developers coming in and um, not necessarily the zoning laws, the, the zoning laws were not really up to date either, but they were the things that really governed. And unfortunately, the politics of the time were such that they thought that the planners that my staff and I were suggesting delaying the conference of plan because we were lazy or we didn't want to do it for some reason. And it took two years to do the conference of plan. And now we're just getting to the zoning regulations, to updating them. And unfortunately, we had two years of being the number two or number six county in the country worth of growth. And we could have, if we would have updated our zoning regulations, we could have gotten a lot more from developers and a lot higher quality if we would have done that two years earlier. So it, it's kind of unfortunate. And there were a couple of jurisdictions who have done that in Virginia. Alexandria is kind of 
one of the um, more forward-thinking cities in Virginia when it comes to planning. And, and they actually consciously decided not to do their comprehensive plan at their five-year anniversary, but they went and changed all their codes. And then they eventually came back to their comprehensive plan, but they knew it had no teeth, so they went to amend what did give them the teeth. And um, they were, I think, better served for it. Um, OK. Moving on to implementation, which in my mind, again, comprehensive planning is good, but if you can't implement it or you can't regulate by it, it it's a nice exercise. It doesn't do a whole lot for you. And there are a million tools that you've learned about. These are just some of the some major groups of tools that I chose to um, play off each other when analyzing or evaluating these three states. Um, and again, making the regulations consistent with the plan. Um, if they're not consistent as in Virginia, then the plan is, is really um, just a pretty picture. Having zoning, subdivision, and, and site plan review, we do have all three of those in Virginia, and all three states have those. Urban growth areas, um, you've probably studied that, and in different states, it has different meanings. In some states, it means that you can't, um, that there's joint planning in these areas. In some places, it means that you're, a, a local government is going to eventually annex that area. Um, that's something that, again, is an important tool, and it depends how it's applied. And in different states, it means different things. Um, realistic capital improvement programs. You, I'm sure you've studied these as well. And uh, Virginia, Maryland, and Florida all have different um, ways of doing things. In Virginia, they're not necessarily very realistic. As a matter of fact, um, three years ago, the, the governor realized that their Department of Transportation, their capital improvement program, had about 20 years worth of projects in it. There was no way they could afford to build them, and they, but they called it their six-year plan. There was no way to build, they, nobody had the money for, tw for probably a 20-year plan where they called it a six-year plan, and they wondered why they never could build all the roads and budget for all the roads that they could, um, that they planned on or called for. So um, Florida and Maryland have much more um, re realistic capital improvement programs, and they actually tie them to land use, what a concept, um, and tr tie them to local plans. Um, adequate public facilities ordinances, if, if you can't, tie those, if you don't have an ordinance, then you can phase projects. That's another important thing you can use in Virginia, but um, you can say, yes, we'll approve your project, but you can't build phase two of it until the, you, we build this six lane highway in front of it. So if you're not gonna build it, you can wait till the town builds it, or you can wait until the Department of Transportation builds it, but you can't build the rest of your project until all the facilities are, are, are there. So it's a way of getting around not having an adequate public facilities ordinance. Um, impact fees uh, are another very useful tool, not legal everywhere. Um, conditional uses, I'll discuss those a little more. And then design review. A lot of, most states, or probably all of them, allow for historic preservation ordinances. And you can design, uh, control design for historic resources or historic buildings and, and control architecture. In other states, beyond the historic buildings, perhaps you can't, like Virginia, you cannot um, regulate architecture. You can regulate site plans, but not the buildings, unless they're in a historic district or across from a historic district. So it's, again, it's another tool that depending on what the law says and what the state law says you can do, it can be very effective or it's not really a tool at all. Um, again, I, taking the last slide and going through some of, some of the Florida tools that they have it, um, in their toolbox. Mandatory plans, um, regulations consistent with plans I talked about. The DRIs I talked about, um, urban growth areas are optional, not mandatory. Capital improvement projects must be realistic, and you actually can't amend, you can't bump a project. If you have a road project that's 
that you say you're going to do next year, you can't bump it to another year unless you go to the town council or city council and have a public hearing on that so that they know you're moving a major, now little projects you can move around, but if you have a major road widening, unless the public gets an opportunity to speak on that, the politicians can't move projects around. Um, concurrency is another thing in Florida. Impact fees are legal in Florida. Um, again, that's another home rule that, issue. The state never mentions impact fees, but because of home rule, one local government decided to do impact fees and try it in Dunedin. They were sued, but they won the lawsuit and set the legal precedent for it in Florida. So the, the state law never really says whether you can do impact fees or not, but because it's a home rule state, all the local governments can, can do it because they took it upon themselves. Some states have, some local governments have them in Florida, some local governments don't use them but it helps them pay for their roads. They also use it for libraries, parks, it depends what city you're in, but in Tampa, we had uh, included in impact fees parks, libraries, um, roads, obviously, and any, a lot of other infrastructure. Uh, some places only use it for roads. It's a, a very effective tool to direct toward development paying its own way. Uh, conditional uses, that's a tool in Virginia that the other states have, but I'll, I'll kind of get to that later. Historic districts. Design review, you can do in Florida anywhere you want. If the local government wants to do uh, architectural review, you can do it. Naples had, uh, this was in the 90s, when big boxes started to coming to very ritzy Naples, Florida. They passed a big box design uh, ordinance probably in the late 90s before most other people even thought of doing that. Um, so they were able to affect the architecture, uh, get rid of this, the massive asphalt, they made them you know, do more landscaping and some other things. So in Florida you can do that. In Maryland you can do that. Um, they have, Maryland has a lot of the similar tools. Um, they have also really done a very good job about tying data and fiscal analyses to their comprehensive plans, to their facilities ordinances, and their capital budgets. They have a lot of studies that are required before the local government can enact an impact fee ordinance, an adequate public facilities ordinance, and some of those other things. So they've preserved, um, they've helped themselves not lose a lot of lawsuits from developers because they've built into the state law that you've got to do a study before you enact one of these, um, one of these programs. They also are very strong with their environmental programs. Maryland, I mean, uh, Virginia, on the other hand, again, as I said, you have to do a plan, but it doesn't, it doesn't regulate the property. Um, the, the zoning does not have to be consistent in Virginia, and as a matter of fact, um, most local governments intentionally don't rezone the property to match the comprehensive plan because the only way um, local governments in Virginia can get exactions for roads or dedications for roads is by what they call the proffer system. And impact fees are not legal in Virginia. Um, and transportation improvements are not required. So the only way you can get a developer to build a road or put in infrastructure is to negotiate it through rezoning. So for example, Leesburg actually intentionally did not rezone several, pro several properties to match the comprehensive plan because they were afraid they couldn't ask the developer for a road improvement if they didn't have to do a rezoning. So you end up with a very ineffective way of doing planning and tying land use and transportation together. We actually have a site that's a small site. It should be an office, but it's zoned for commercial. And three different kinds of uses have come in, a Kentucky Fried Chicken and an auto service. And because there's no other way to get road improvements, the council has approved a used car lot on a site 
that should have an office or townhouse complex because it's next to residential, but they needed that road improvement out, out in front of that project and there was no way to get it, so they made a bad land use decision allowing a car lot in an inappropriate place in order to get the intersection improved. This happens all over Virginia because there are not a lot of tools that you can use for that. Um, uh, urban growth areas and uh, capital improvement plans, yes, you, have to, you don't have to do them, they're optional. Uh, adequate public facilities ordinances and impact fees are only permitted in three jurisdictions in the whole state. And this gets back to the home rule versus the Dillon rule. Because Virginia is a Dillon rule state, um, nobody had the power to do impact fees or adequate public facility ordinances unless they asked the DAD, the state um, legislature, could we do it? Rather than allow everybody to do it, they let Fairfax County, again, is one of the most progressive and largest counties, they asked to do it, they let Fairfax do it, and probably in a few years they'll let some other people do it when they see it's not such a bad thing. But right now only three jurisdictions, Fairfax and the two counties next to Fairfax, can, which is um, Northern Virginia uh, adjacent to Washington DC where all the traffic problems um, are. So there's, again, the Dillon Rule prohibits all the other however many counties there are in Virginia from doing this unless they go and ask the legislature, can I please do this? It's very ineffective. Um, conditional uses, conditional zoning, the, everybody's allowed to do conditional uses, but in Virginia, I mean in, in graduate school we all, planning school we all learn conditional zoning is illegal. Well, not in Virginia. In Virginia it's legal and it's the way that we get all these road improvements, the only way. Um, as a matter of fact, they have zoning, for example, B1, B2, B3, typical zoning districts, R1, R2, R3, but because of the way you do these proffers or conditions, you could actually have a zoning district that says B1, but if you look up 10 years ago when that B1 zoning was approved, it has conditions on it. So there's no regular zoning in Virginia. It's kind of like the state is one big planned unit development and you can't ever answer a zoning question. If a realtor calls up and says, can I put a shoe store on the corner of Market Street and whatever, and you say yes, but, and you actually have to go research the previous rezonings to make sure that it didn't say anything is okay except a shoe store or anything's okay, and if you put a shoe store there, then it only has to be, you know, expensive shoes. It's, it's a very odd system, legal system, but, um, and very labor intensive if you uh, manage a planning department as I do. And the last thing in Virginia, the tools, again, only in historic districts. So my town is actually asking the legislature this year if we can do architectural design review for a redevelopment area that's right next to our historic district. Um, we don't want developers to come in and kind of ruin the approach to the historic district, but we can't regulate architecture there right now. So we have to go all the way to the legislature. We did it last year and it never made it to the floor. So now we're trying again this year for some guy in Richmond to say, or 100 guys in Richmond to say whether Leesburg with 36,000 people can regulate architecture outside the historic district. It's not high on their priority list, so we probably don't have a huge chance again to get that passed. About five or six other local governments in Virginia over the last 10 years have gotten that kind of authority, and so we're, we're pursuing that, but it's not gonna be high on, high on their political list, I'm sure. And lastly, just so you see that I'm, I am very, very pro-Florida, but so you, see that I'm not completely um, not open-minded. This is from a Sierra Club study that if you look on their website and see state, state rankings, they did a study where, um, I wasn't gonna put this in because it had Florida second under Maryland and all these categories, but um, I thought I'd be a little open-minded. But they ranked 
uh, planning in the 50 states, and they have their own criteria that clearly is not very good. Um, and uh, it, it's a very good, uh, again, resource to see. They give a little blurb on each state and what they've done, good versus bad. And uh, again, just another source. And if you go to their website, it's pretty easy to find. And last, I guess the moral of my story is that comprehensive planning is uh, a great tool, but it's not the be all end all of tools. And if you can't implement your plan with some other creativity, then um, you, you might get to be a frustrated planner depending on what state you're in. And it also affects, the state laws also affects the jobs. Here's the bottom line to you guys. The number of jobs in planning and in a lot of cases, the salary of jobs. Florida has a lot of planning jobs because they have a lot more planning to do, as does Maryland, Virginia, not necessarily so. So I thank you all very much and um, I appreciate you having me here. Questions and answers or comments. We have about 10 minutes to go and then there's refreshments. So if Susan can entertain some questions, including the gallery up there. This is the smartest student that we have right here. Susan, these are mostly first year students. Uh, what, what are you working on as a real issue, just in good down to earth terms that you're working on this school in Leesburg, In Leesburg, Virginia, we just did neighborhood redevelopment plan called the Crescent District Plan. It's the area that I mentioned we're trying to get architectural review. It was an industrial, had a, a window and door manufacturer on nine acres and then the whole area around it was right next to our historic district. The, the land prices in the DC area are so high that the in, industries have moved out to West Virginia and left this wonderfully located land, but a little bit of a brownfield area. And um, we wanted to kind of get ahead of the development community and say what we wanted in the area rather than have them dictate it to us. And um, so we did a plan for this area. It's a couple hundred acres. And we you know, came up with some architectural guidelines, some uh, a public park. We have um, linkages from our trail. We have a big trail that goes all the way from Washington, D.C., almost to West Virginia, like 50-mile trail. Runs right through our town, so there's a lot of development, a lot of bicycling people, uh, hiking people who come through there. So that's, that's the most fun thing that we're doing right now. Other questions? Okay. There's a brave soul. Well, DC, I, and I guess I knew this before I moved there, but I never really thought about it. Um, the District of Columbia um, has to go through Congress to get a lot of their authority, and um, especially funding. So they do have. Um, a comprehensive plan, and this mayor actually has put a huge amount of money into planning and neighborhood planning, revitalization plans, um, a lot of urban design, and um, as done in the last uh, six years, I think, however long Mayor Williams has been mayor, he's done a lot. But when the District of Columbia has to go for their budget approval, they have to go to Congress and get their budget approved. Same for their school district. So they have a lot of, a lot of issues. I shouldn't complain about Virginia because they have a lot, um, a lot of other obstacles. But th this mayor, it, for them, it's dependent on who's been mayor, and he's done a really, really great job elevating planning for the district in the last six or eight years. Do I? Yes. No. Oh, okay. But Leesburg has a historic district. Do you see uh, preservation ordinances as aid to planning, or is it kind of like It's a huge aid to planning. And despite what some people say about it costs more money, um, 
even though it costs more money perhaps to put your windows in or to paint your building a different color, the market value, it's, it's a proven fact. There are many studies that the cost of the improvement is greatly outweighed by the added market value of being in a historic district. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, you went to all these different places and all the zoning laws and are different. Would you feel that it was more, I don't, don't really know how to ask this, but like, say West in Virginia, you had a little bit more difficult time getting plans passed and stuff like that because of zoning and all that. Do you feel it's a good thing that that happens? Because I think it challenges the planner more into figuring out a creative way to implementing their plan or do you feel it's more of a like hassle and it's not worth the trouble like zoning? Um, it is in some ways you, you certainly can be creative but the window is very small. Um, you can still be creative in Florida and Maryland and maybe you could actually get it done. In Virginia you can think out of the box but the box is really small and there's no point in thinking out of the box because you can't do it. Um, so yes, it is, more, it is challenging, but it's frustrating to see you know, states around you who, you know, oh, well, they're doing tax increment financing, and actually, Virginia finally adopted it, but everybody's afraid to use it. Or they're doing impact fees, or they're doing you know, adequate public facilities. So th there are a lot of tools out there, but, but it is, um, frustrating and and when it all comes down to it the developers it's a very pro-development state and so if you we've actually I've been there four years and we've either sued or been willing to be sued twice and we've lost both times and it wasn't because of a mistake on our part it was because the law didn't support you know doing that we were we were willing to push the envelope but so you you got to be willing to try, and sometimes it sticks, and sometimes it doesn't. Thank, thank you very. Oh, there's another one. The financial impact on having more planning ability or more planning law and regulation versus not having it. Um, I guess my question specifically is, uh, what would be the effect on development levels and or housing costs? Are housing costs higher in really pro planning states versus one that's just kind of really milling? I'm sure a million studies out there, but my experience is that regu most regulations don't affect the cost of housing. I mean, unless there's truly exclusionary zoning, which isn't really legal. But, um, and, it, and actually in Virginia, it turns out that there's an indirect relationship because there's fewer laws, but housing prices are like out the roof. So, um, you know, there's a lot of other issues for, for housing. But, for example, there's uh, affordable housing in the whole DC area is a horrible, horrible problem. And um, it's not mandatory that you address it they finally have an option that you, if you address it, you can only address it this one way. And they actually build the formula into the state law. Um, you have to give a 10%, uh, you have to give a uh, intense density bonus. And you can't ask them for more than 10.5% or some of affordable units. But, and, and it's not affordable, affordable housing for um, the perception of low income people. I mean, there are, families in Leesburg who their children go to college and they can't afford to live back in Leesburg anymore because there's nothing less than $350,000. So it's, it's rampant throughout the DC area, yet there's hardly any regulation. So in that case, I don't think it's related, but there, there are certainly things you could do to make it worse or better. That's Why it. is planning different in the three states? Leadership, planners, radar, are not noticed, or is it some other force that's a threat? Um, it's the, I think leadership has a lot to do with it, and um, uh, that's Marth Grote, 
smart growth manual really deals with that a lot, actually, and a lot of suggestions. But I think in Virginia, a lot of it is, Virginia reminds, the politics of Virginia now remind me of Florida um, in the 70s and earlier, which I don't remember because I was a child, but it, about 20 years ago. And that was that um, in Florida, the rural uh, parts of the state governed politically. The legislature was run by the geographically the majority of the state, which was ranchers. And